Hi, it's been a pleasure to present here at ICEMGT 2020. I'm Yu Shen, an independent researcher from mainland China and a recent graduate from Royal Holloway University of London. What I present here is an independent project of mine. It's concerned about the discrimination against sexual minority groups in China as reflected on their income. It looks at the income gap between Chinese homosexuals and heterosexuals and tries to evaluate if Chinese employers have been discriminating against their employees and also its implications. Sexual minority groups have been fighting for equal rights for over half a century, and indeed there has been progress. Many countries now recognize same-sex civil unions and have signed equal rights for sexual minority into law. But in the workplace, the discrimination still discreetly exists and still does actual harm. I investigate the workplace not only because discrimination is unfair and diversity makes the individual happy, but because equal rights for sexual minority employees makes the team more productive in general and helps to build positive public images. This has been proven to contribute to a company's efficiency and market value. And I choose to investigate the Chinese workplace because there's little prior work in the area. All research so far on workplace discrimination based on sexual orientation was done against a Western backdrop. East Asia is completely left out. In East Asia, sexual minorities are seen differently than in the West, and laws don't recognize many of their rights. So it's meaningful to take China as a starting point for further research in the East Asian context. This is also an opportunity to check if the existing framework of research can apply cross-culturally to East Asian societies. Most of the existing research I just mentioned focuses on pay differences and relies on data analysis. Very few projects take advantage of interviews and social experiments. So in general, prior research suggests that gay workers earn less than street males, even though some don't see a significant gap, meaning gay men are indeed discriminated against in the workplace. At the same time, hardly any research shows that lesbian workers earn less than street females. Actually, many papers suggest the opposite. That's to say being a homosexual woman isn't deemed negative in the workplace, and sometimes is considered an advantage. There have been some possible explanations for this. It could be that lesbian workers are said to be more focused on their career because they are less bound to the traditional gender role of babysitting and housekeeping. It could also be that lesbian workers are more motivated because they don't expect male partners to provide for them. Now, while existing research almost invariably relies on tried and true regression analysis between income and sexual orientation, there's still something contentious about the methodology they used. First, on the samples taken. It used to be a popular option to survey employees working in a single sector or even for a single big name company. Samples taken this way are statistically significant, but I doubt if the conclusions drawn from there can apply to the entire labor market. Different workplace cultures manifest as different attitudes towards sexual minorities who are sensitive to this difference. In certain sectors, the discrimination could even be the other way around. Gay men in fashion industry could earn more than straight men because they are seen as being more refined. Likewise, samples taken on queer forums or discussion groups can be biased toward a certain circle or stratum of the society and skew the income numbers. It's still difficult to gather a large enough sample that equally represents everyone of the sexual minority. Second, on identifying homosexuals. Some researchers had the participants report their orientation, and others deduce it from the participants' response to questions such as, who do you live with? The problem with the former approach is that homosexuals often conceal their orientation, and more so if they are interviewed in the workplace. On the other hand, the latter approach sees a lot of false positives, since just because your roommate shares your gender doesn't mean you are homosexual. 
Third, on calculating income. Some researchers compare annual incomes, others compare daily wages, and yet others take overtime work into account and compare hourly rates. Overtime is a tricky factor because the amount of overtime varies a lot across different sectors and age groups. So my research is based on data from the 2015 Chinese General Social Survey administered by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. To this day, it remains the most inclusive, rigorous, and long-lasting social survey ever done in mainland China. It sampled the population through multi-stage stratified sampling and interviewed each participant in person. These 11,000 validated responses are one's best bet at a data set that encompasses the entire Chinese society. To accurately identify homosexuals, I took advantage of the survey's design. So, participants of that survey are asked to provide information on family members that may or may not live with them, such as their gender and relation to the participant. Here, I consider a participant homosexual if they describe someone of their gender to be spouse or partner. I feel confident about this approach because the survey doesn't pressure queers to hide their orientation. The dozens of questions they had to answer don't focus on gender, and there isn't a direct question like, are you homosexual? Also, participants know beforehand that their response will be kept confidential. On the other hand, taking this kind of self-report into account helps to avoid marking heterosexual roommates or friends as homosexual. Considering that in China, certain sectors and regions are much more subject to overtime than others do, I adjusted the hourly rate for overtime and used that adjusted wage for income comparison. I looked into various statistical research on income and identified some variables that affect a person's earning potential and are found in the 2015 survey. This includes participants' nationality, political standing, education, work experience, job type, and speaking and listening proficiency in Mandarin and English. With this, I set up a regression model and compared income between male heterosexuals and homosexuals and female heterosexuals and homosexuals. Surprisingly, the model shows that in mainland China and across genders, there isn't a significant income gap between heterosexuals and homosexuals. But as we know, East Asian countries such as China, Japan, and Korea have been sort of a gray zone for sexual minorities. Laws don't endorse same-sex marriage and don't recognize the right to inherit property from a deceased same-sex partner. Just little to no law to protect queer rights in general, and governments don't support their activism. Especially in China, where the culture emphasizes tradition, collectivism, obedience, and the continuation of family lineage, the society naturally sees queers through a tinted lens. So why do sexual minorities in mainland China not take an income penalty? Existing research on sexual minorities in mainland China mostly focuses on AIDS control, but I was able to find a possible explanation for my conclusion in non-academic literature. United Nations Development Program's 2016 report, Being LGBT in China, surveys more than 30,000 queers and arrives at a conclusion. LGBT in China hardly ever come out of the closet, with just 5.4% of them disclosing their orientation in the workplace. So, it's likely that Chinese LGBT workers try harder than their Western counterparts do to hide their sexual identity in their workplace. Discrimination doesn't hit them if their colleagues don't know about their orientation. But, even when sexual minorities hide their orientation and don't earn less for not being straight, they still feel discriminated against in the workplace. In China, this takes various forms, including being told to dress, speak, and behave more properly, or even bitter comments on their image. So, hiding one's identity in the public causes emotional pressure, which is prevalent among sexual minorities in mainland China. 
and the push towards modern diversity management will certainly benefit both the sexual minority and business in the long run. As to the limitations of my research, at first glance, it seems suspicious that my results don't line up with existing findings that are based off self-reports on discrimination against Chinese sexual minorities. Admittedly, their findings are based off self-reporting by a limited slice of the population, and they focus on subjective feelings instead of quantitative comparison of income. But it still raises a red flag that I arrived at an opposite conclusion because my methodology isn't perfect either. And as I mentioned earlier, there's no prior work to check against. First, the Chinese General Social Survey is not specialized for investigating the situation of sexual minorities. Just because its data are widely used for research doesn't mean the data are accurate with regards to sexual minorities. For example, when an interviewer shows their prejudice against queers, homosexual participants would withhold the truth. Despite this, more sexual minority scholars have come to do what I did. Now, they rely on general social surveys, which offer larger samples but less targeted towards studying sexual minorities. In the foreseeable future, researchers will still find it hard to obtain data sets that are both large enough and accurate for their topics. Second, the deduction method that I use to identify homosexuals obviously excludes participants that were not in a long-term relationship at a time because they didn't report having a same-sex partner. This probably caused inaccuracy, not only because I may have left out many homosexuals, but also because scholars have recently concurred that there are far wider gaps in partner-based comparison of total personal income when compared with population-based income. But because my research shows that Chinese homosexuals in a relationship don't take a significant income penalty, the consensus I just mentioned could also imply that single Chinese homosexuals don't earn less for being homosexual. A meta-analysis of existing work should offer insights and help researchers to fix anomalies in the raw data. And third, there's yet to be a universal statistical methodology that accounts for salary, bonuses, variations in work time, and more importantly, different income structures in different economies, cultures, and industries. I chose to ignore bonuses in my income comparison. But in mainland China, state employees rely much heavier on bonuses than private sector's employees do, which means that ignoring bonuses could make civil servants and similar professions' income appear much lower. The lesson to learn here is probably that Further studies on income of a certain sexual minority group must pay a closer attention to structures of the income and accordingly decide how to calculate it. On a side note, in recent years, researchers are moving away from income, which is easy to draw from readily available data. They are exploring other non-monetary aspects of workplace discrimination, such as how the glass ceiling affects sexual minorities. Another issue worth noting is that hardly any research has properly subdivided sexual minorities and separately studied each subgroup, such as bisexual people, asexual people, and transgender people. Most contemporary research just conflate them with homosexuals. Considering some of these subgroups may be even more marginalized and produce extreme responses to surveys, identifying them as separate subjects for discussion can enhance existing research. Also, it's been reported that white gay men are less subject to discrimination than other gay men are, so researchers working with multi-ethnic datasets have to be aware of how racial discrimination plays a role. Likewise, I believe differences in religious affiliation could have a similar impact. Finally, researchers working on discrimination against East Asian sexual minorities should be aware that methodologies used to study the same subject in the West and the corresponding conclusions don't necessarily apply as is. Different culture and mores could turn into different forms of discrimination against sexual minorities. On top of that, 
The validity of self-reporting is also culture dependent. Still, since data analysis has its aforementioned limitations, conducting individual interviews in the target culture is probably an indispensable step towards a satisfactory theoretical framework for further research in this area. This concludes my report. Thanks for making it through the end. It takes collaborative effort to further develop the study of sexual minorities. So please do leave a comment or email me with your questions and thoughts. I'm more than happy to discuss.